Welcome to Calling a City to Life, a podcast by Queen's Park Baptist Church in Glasgow. Each week you'll hear from us two episodes, the talk and the chat. First up is the talk, and that's the audio version of this week's sermon as preached at Queen's Park Baptist. So this is your opportunity to listen to it again or to listen to it for the first time. And later on in the week, you'll be able to tune in again and download the chat where we gather around and discuss in a bit more detail some of the issues and themes raised in this week's talk. Thank you for tuning in to the talk. We hope you enjoy it. And we look forward to you tuning in again later in the week. Enjoy. Good morning and welcome. I trust that somebody's already welcomed you this morning. Fiona's got us to say Hello to each other. Special welcome to you if you are a visitor and special welcome to you if you're back from the high seas. It's good to see David Robertson uh, with us. You're getting one clap, David. Sorry. Um, And good morning to those of you who are joining us online or if you're listening to the podcast at a some point. Um, Last week with Des, which was great, and it was great to hear what God has done in Des's life through Jesus, um, and uh, about Alpha, and get excited about that. But the week before, Ian kicked off a series that we're doing in Revelation. I remember when I was at school, uh, as Christians, we were scared to read Revelation. The people who were reading Revelation were the guys who were into heavy metal, particularly Iron Maiden. Um, If you know their music, you'll get why they were uh, into that. But we're going to look at the book of Revelation, and Ian did a wonderful job in setting things up for us with his reflection on uh, chapter 1. If you missed Ian, then good news is you can still hear Ian. Just go to the uh, podcast archives, and uh, you will find uh, his sermon there, because how Ian set up chapter one helps us engage with the rest of the book. Um, So go back and check uh, Ian out on the podcast and his sermon. While we're speaking of the podcast, this week we've got a special guest. Some of you might have heard of him, somebody called Nicky Gumbel, I think his name is. Um, So if you want to hear what Nicky is going to say, he's going to say something brief, I think, uh, to us. And one of the things that Ian did when he spoke on chapter one was that he reminded us that this is in first and foremost a revelation about Jesus. And as such, it's not so much prophetic foretelling as prophetic foretelling. Who are we in Christ? Who is this Christ that we worship? And who are we in Christ in this time? It's style, it's imagery, it's language that's firmly uh, within what we would call apocalyptic literature. Now, if you're watching TV and somebody uses the words apocalyptic, they're normally describing some unimaginable disaster, something that's off the charts. But as Ian rightly pointed out, Biblical apocalypse isn't about disaster or destruction, but about revelation. It's the tearing of a veil. It's the opening of the curtain that we can see what previously could not be seen. The perspective that they're given is now heaven sent. They see the deeper truth of reality that they could not have understood from their own reasoning, seeing, and hearing. And the book of Revelation, one of the things it's revealing to those churches and therefore reveals to us is what what does discipleship look like? What does it look like to follow Jesus in an environment that is so often against Jesus and against God? What does it mean to be a faithful, obedient witness? And what does it mean to worship Jesus in spirit and truth? It's not a letter about escaping our world with its troubles and joys, but it seeks to bring hope where there is fear, strengthen our loyalty and faithfulness to Jesus where that is weak, and correct our worship where that has become distorted. In Revelation 2 and 3 that we're going to think of today, 
And Jesus in the Spirit speaks to seven of the churches in Asia Minor. We're going to take these two chapters together as a whole and then think about some of the churches, not all of them, because if we're going to think about all of them, we'd be here a very long time. So I'm going to miss out going into any detail about three churches which received both praise and rebuke. So we're not going to speak about Ephesus, Pergamum, and Thyatira this morning. If you want to hear about Pergamum, where Jesus says Satan's throne is there, or about the references to Balaam and Jezebel and the Nicolaitans and food and sex, then I've recorded something for the podcast. That will go out as an addition to some part of the podcast. That's Richard's department. But as we were worshipping, Linda kind of like had a message or a, a, a word of, do you know what? We need to know our identity in Christ because when we know our identity in Christ, we know that we have authority. And that's part of the message to the church in Pergamum. You live in a spiritually really difficult place. Satan's got a throne there. And yet you can be strong in me because you are in me. Is part of what Jesus is saying. So as Nikki was encouraging us to lift situations up, know that you have authority in Jesus to lift those situations up and, and uh, stand in his promises um, uh, in all of that. And Karen had a, a similar kind of like word about our identity. And our identity is as children of God. Now, one of the things I love seeing on a Sunday morning is the kids play. And God is inviting us to play, not to be super stressed, not to be anxious, not to be fear-ridden, but to know that he's got us. One of the pictures that we have here is of Jesus holding the seven stars, and the seven stars is the church. He holds us. He doesn't just have us. He holds us, and because he holds us, we have that authority, but we also have that safety. That doesn't mean that it's easy, so we can play. Enough of that. Let's uh, turn to uh, chapters 2 and 3. I'm going to, for time, just read portions, so it's perhaps easier, actually, to fall, follow on the, the screen. Uh, but if you want to follow along on your phone or Bible, we're in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. So I'm going to start at verse 8. An angel to the church in Smyrna write, these are the words of the first and the last who was dead and came to life. I know your affliction and your poverty, even though you are rich. I know the slander on the part of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear what you are about to suffer. Beware the devil is about to throw some of you into prison so that you may be tested, and for ten days you will have affliction. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Let anyone who is an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Whoever conquers will not be harmed by the second death. Let's jump into chapter 3. And to the angel in the church in Sardis write, these are the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have a name for being alive, but you're dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is at the point of death, for I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Obey it and repent. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these are the words of the Holy One, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. I know your works. Look, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut, and I know you have little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. And to the angel of the church at Laodicea write the words of the Amen and the faithful and true witness, the origin of God's creation. I know your works. They're neither hot nor cold. I wish, I wish that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I am about to spit you out my mouth. For you say, I'm rich. I've prospered. 
I need nothing. Do not realize that you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Therefore, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white robes to clothe you and keep the shame of your nakedness from being seen and salve to anoint your eyes so you may see. I reprove and discipline those whom I love. Be earnest, therefore, and repent. Listen, I am standing at the door knocking. If you hear my voice, open the door. I'll come into you and eat with you and you with me. To the one who conquers, I will give a place with me on my throne. Just as I myself conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let anyone who has an ear to listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. Now, if you were a travel, uh, going on holiday and went to a travel agent and uh, went in and over-eager, they're always over-eager in travel agents, aren't they? Uh, and the person said, where would you like to go? And you were to say, hey, fancy Asia Minor. You might get a funny look. And yet, I suspect some of you have holidayed in the area that these churches are. The seven churches are in modern-day Turkey. Gavin, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Um, and the message starts with the church in Ephesus, and then Jesus and the Spirit speak in a geographic clockwise uh, direction. Most of these cities are now in ruin. You can go and visit the ruins. But Smyrna is modern-day Ismar, and Pergamum is modern-day Bergama. Now, while some of us may have holidayed in or near that area, many of you will know that we have someone with us who lived for many years in that area, indeed lived in Smyrna for two years. So I'm going to ask Lena if she'll just come and pray for the modern-day uh, church in Turkey. Thank you. Well, it was in the 90s that we were in uh, Smyrna, Izmir, and if any of you were around in the church at that time, we were there to support a Turkish pastor. He had a very small group at that time, but it grew and it got to the point where it needed a building. And at the same time, there was a big um, congregational uh, offering for the refurbishment of this building because we were going to be moving into this building. And that large offering was tithed and was sent to Izmir, to Smyrna, to help them buy their first building. And you'll be glad to know that they've now outgrown that building. And there are seven or eight churches now in Izmir. So let me, let me pray for the situation. Yes, Father, we thank you that your son indeed is the Alpha and the Omega, that he was dead but now is alive forevermore. And we thank you that you are calling the city of Izmir, the ancient city of Smyrna, to life. And we thank you for the growth of the church, the church in Turkey. And though it's small in comparison to the millions of inhabitants, we thank you that the trajectory is upwards, that it is in growth. And you know the afflictions, you know the persecutions that followers of Jesus encounter in Turkey, but you also know the great sufferings of the country itself with an economic crisis, with a slide into dictatorship and with the terrible earthquake. Six months later, whole towns are living in containers. And we thank you that you are using your church, that your church is able to take its place in service, serving the needy of the country. And this is changing the perception of Christianity. And so we praise you, Lord. We praise you that in the midst of suffering, you are doing a beautiful thing. I spoke to a Turkish girl um, yesterday, and she said in our church, 11 people were baptized last Sunday. There's like a fog of love 
resting on the city. We thank you, Lord. Thank you for what you are doing. And so we pray for your church. We pray, Lord, that you will help them to be refreshed by your spirit day by day. We ask you to give them boldness to keep sharing the word of truth. We, we ask you to keep them humble, especially as, as groups multiply in these needy regions. We ask you to keep the leadership humble and united, that indeed love will speak volumes to that needy, hurting country. We pray that many will see, many will fear, and put their trust in the Lord. For the glory of Jesus, amen. Amen. Thank you, Lena. I think there's a challenge with uh, Revelation 2 and 3 um, that we kind of separate it off from the rest of the book. And it's important for us to remember that the whole of the book of Revelation addresses these seven specific churches, and by extension, us and the churches around us. And the core of what Jesus and the Spirit says to the churches in these seven brief oracles is the core of the message of the whole book. You can perhaps summarize it as something like this, of Jesus saying, I am present with you as the one who has come, is coming, and will come. My current presence with you empowers you to live as conquerors. Jesus-type conquerors. So let's think about how Jesus conquered. In the midst of challenges, even in the face of death, my future presence with you and my soon return brings to completion the transformation that is already at work within you and within this world. Live now in the good of that completion. Live as though that completion has happened. Live as citizens not of Rome, but as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Above all, remain steadfast and continue to be my faithful worshippers and witnesses. I am the one who was, who is, and who shall be. Behold, I am both with you and coming soon. That, I think, is a summary of the whole book. And for some of us, that lands a bit awkwardly. Angel had a word of, you know, what some of us are struggling to kind of like sing about God's faithfulness because we feel as though he's let us down. We've had disappointments. The church is in Asia Minor. They had some fairly major disappointments. Antipatus gets killed. I think that's quite disappointing. Um, And yet they are told to remain faithful. And we see in the Psalms that, you know what, God is big enough. In fact, I think God encourages to go with him to him with our disappointments and say, why God? Why has this happened? To cling on to him, but the important thing is that we cling on to him because who else has the words of life? And in chapter two and three, this big theme and comes into sharp focus and looks to equip the saints of these seven churches to live as agents of kingdom transformation in a world full of dangers and troubles. And it's a message to the churches. It speaks to us as church first and then as individuals. And the consequences of this, that Revelation addresses as first as the church, rather than just as individuals, are multiple. Eugene Peterson does a wonderful job of unpacking much of what those consequences are. Ian mentioned this wee book, a Reversed Thunder by Eugene Peterson. It's, he gets wonderfully grump, grumpy in chapter four. I think he had a hard week when he wrote chapter four. Um, And much of what I would want to say about how understanding Revelation is addressing us and not just me, Peterson picks up. So I would recommend that book to you. But perhaps all I need to say regarding addressing us 
and in one sense here I'm preaching to the choir, is church matters. Church matters. So it's good that you are here this morning. And while we know that being together on a Sunday is important, we also know, well, at least I hope we know, that church is not just a Sunday. Church describes our connectedness in Christ and therefore our commitment and love to each other. Our participation in God's mission and taking his good news and his love out from beyond us. And that, of course, goes beyond a Sunday. So let's live that out. And Revelation 2 and 3 doesn't speak to the church in the abstract. He speaks to seven concrete expressions of church. He doesn't lump as so many books and contemporary seminars in church do. The church is all together. But he addresses each one of them. The significance of seven is that seven is the number of completion. The seven days of creation, because creation at that stage had been completed. And there are churches in this region that aren't spoken to, perhaps most famously Colossae, which is just a few miles from Laodicea. But in speaking to these seven churches and it representing completion, he speaks to all churches. So the Spirit and Christ speak to us. And that there are more than one church reminds us that God is both the God of unity and diversity. God is one. And yet the mystery of the Trinity is that he is three persons. And the church in our multiplicity, in our unity and yet diversity, shows something of this character and nature of God. There's also a really practical reason for there being multiple churches as well, isn't there? That we need local diverse di expressions. And given every church is an expression of God's holy people in a specific time, context, and location, then every expression of church is shaped by that time, our history, our location, by you and who you are and what you bring. And we see this clearly in the seven churches in Asia Minor. It is not a cookie-cutter church. They are not clones of some kind of franchise. They're different. They have their own struggles. They express how they worship God slightly differently. So while they in common face the challenges of living under the hegemonic Roman Empire, how they experience that is different and how they respond to it is different. Indeed, for two of the seven churches, for Philadelphia and Smyrna, the greatest challenge seems not to be Rome, but Jews in the city who are slandering them and creating trouble for them. In Laodicea, the challenge seems not to be persecution as such, but that life is just actually a bit too comfortable. They've confused what it means to live in the kingdom of God with the wealth and lifestyle of their culture and have compromised their faith important aside before moving on. Regrettably, church history is full of instances where people have used the New Testament, where it talks of Jews negatively, as in Revelation 2.9 and 3.9, to stir up anti-Semitic feeling, which has at times led to terrible violence. And to go in this direction from what is written here in Revelation or elsewhere in the New Testament is to abuse and distort God's word. These comments about the Jews are not anti-Jewish, but they're anti what certain people who claim to be Jews were teaching and doing, and that distinction is important. Indeed, we think that given of how much 
John draws on the imagery of the Old Testament prophets that the churches that he's writing to are full of Jewish Christian believers. Back to the broader point, the context of these churches is slightly different. And that means that the word that Jesus brings to each church is specific to them. Jesus doesn't change, does he? What's Jesus' specific word? What's his specific call on us? Our history, our present circumstances, our context, our location. Do you know what? It's different from other churches, even different from other churches in Glasgow. So what's he calling us to specifically do? How is he calling us specifically to show forth who he is and his love and his grace and his truth? To merely copy what other churches do because it works or it looks the right thing to do is to fall into the trap of the church at Sardis who thought they'd a good name and reputation for what they did. But the reality was they were dead or as near dead as dead can be. And if Jesus has a specific word for us, a call upon this church, then one of the most important things that we can do is listen. Ian, the other Sunday there, mentioned the importance of our church meetings. Now, we delegate several functions to the SLT, to the senior leadership team. And while we expect and certainly hope that they are listening to what Jesus is saying to the church, that's your job. We hold to the biblical principle and practice that it's when we gather together as his people that we hear most clearly and we discern most accurately what Jesus is saying to us. Eugene Peterson comments, the Spirit speaks, the people listen. Listening is the common task of the church. Churches are listening posts. We want to always be a people who are listening. We want to be listening this morning to what Jesus is saying to us as his church. But we give specific time at our church meetings. They're never just a business meeting. The business of the church meeting is to listen and discern what God is saying to us. So that's not to make anyone guilty for having missed church meetings, but it is to say, I'm going to come to the next one because it's actually really quite important. Let's zoom in a little and think about the word to Smyrna and Philadelphia, and then we'll think about the words to Sardis and Laodicea. The churches at Smyrna and Philadelphia receive a message that has no rebuke. I guess we'd like to be like them, wouldn't they? God, could we have that word, the no rebuke word, please? Well, it was in these churches that most keenly, most severely, the saints were facing economic hardship and social exclusion. I wonder if the no rebuke and that go together. The answer to their social marginalization is not to find a way to the center of civic and political life. And I think that's an important word for us to hear given where we now are post-Christendom. They're not trying to get Christians in to run the local city. Rather, Jesus calls them to fear not and be faithful to him. Don't compromise who you are in me. In contrast to the church in Sardis, which had gained some kind of reputation for being alive, the church in Philadelphia, which doesn't receive a rebuke, has what? Little power. Perhaps it even has a reputation for being weak. Jesus doesn't tell them to go and become powerful or important to, or, or to undertake all sorts of events and activities so that they can gain influence and a reputation. I think they would do really poorly in our social media age because their Facebook page and their website is going to be rubbish. 
Jesus tells him to hold fast and go through the door he opens, which is a clear reference to Isaiah 22, 22. Look it up later. And the door that Jesus opens up to them is not a new ministry opportunity. The door that he opens up to them is his sanctuary. In your troubles, come to me because I have opened the door is what he is saying to this church. The struggling poor church in Smyrna is instructed to be faithful until death and if they do this, they'll receive a crown of life. Now, being faithful until death may indeed include dying for their faith and that's the experience of many of our brothers and sisters in this world today. But most probably it meant and certainly it includes within its range of meaning that they should remain faithful until they die a normal, natural death. Be in this for the long haul. Don't give up. Don't quit when it gets hard. To borrow a phrase from elsewhere, the Christian life is a long obedience in the same direction. And the reward promised to them is not an end of earthly suffering or hardship or the giving of worldly wealth, but the crown of life. And the word for crown here is not diadema, a royal crown, but Stephanos, the laurel leaf. We've seen it kind of like it on films or, you know, Olympics and things like that. It's the, re- the crown, can't say wreath, crown which is given to an athletic or military victor. You may not feel victorious, but in Christ you are. And the message is clear. We know who is one. We know who is one. Jesus is the victor. And you didn't give these wreaths out in the middle of the battle. You gave them out when the battle had ended. And in saying, I'm going to give you this crown, is saying, this too shall pass. This too shall pass. The war is not forever. Life is not dispensed by Caesar. The Pax Romana is a myth. Only Jesus, the Prince of Peace, brings true peace. Challengingly, there are two churches where nothing good is said about them. That's disappointing. They just receive a rebuke. Sardis and Laodicea. Perhaps too often we just jump to Laodicea and forget about Sardis. And I think in hearing the word to both of these churches, we need to keep in mind the words that Jesus and the Spirit actually bring to Laodicea. I reprove and I discipline those whom I love. Jesus loves his church. You know, it's dead easy for us to be critical about ourselves, about the church down the road, about the church around the other side of the world. Jesus loves his church. And it's Jesus' job to reprove and discipline his church. Not mine, not yours. Jesus does that. And there are a few issues going on at Sardis. They're putting on a good face, as we've already said. They have a reputation for being alive, but the deeper truth is that their good reputation is masking their deadness. And I think this serves as a helpful reminder that what happens up front, what happens here in a Sunday service, is not actually always a good indication of how alive we are. This message to this church reminds us that we are not called to do things for God, but things with God and in Christ. It reminds of us our, our need to abide in God. I get the sense that the church in Sardis were just doing stuff and they'd forgotten to invite God to be part of it. But actually, it's the other way around. God invites us to be part of what he's already doing. 
we get on to that next chapters where we see now the pictures in chapter five, four. It's not of future heaven. It's of heaven now in which we are invited to be part of that worship, but here on earth. That's next week. Spend time with God. Put aside your want list, your petition list, your intercession list. Spend time with God. Five minutes, two minutes, three minutes, ten minutes. And just say, God, I just choose to sit as your child in your presence. Help me to know and experience your life-changing, character-transforming love. I ask nothing else. I just ask for you. Open my eyes to what you're doing that I would join in. Laodicea is perhaps the most famous of the seven churches, and yet I suspect that the message to her is the most interpreted and misunderstood. The problem with the church at Laodicea is not so much that they'd lost their zeal or their passion for Jesus. The problem with this church is that they'd lost their need for him. I suspect that if you were to have turned up at Laodicea, you'd have seen a passionate bunch of people worshipping. But what happened on a Sunday failed to impact their lives individually or corporately through the rest of the week. The issue was not that they were apathetic, but that they were proud, independent, and comfortable. And so they thought they didn't really actually need Jesus. Let me explain. Laodicea, it's the wealthiest city in the region. It made its money from textiles and from eye salve, which is why the word at the end says, you have no gold, you need to buy gold from me. You're naked, you need to buy clothes from me. And your eyes are sore and blind, you need to buy salve from me. You can't get that at the local market, you can only get this from me. And we know that it's wealthy, not just from like history and archaeology, but because verse 17 has them saying, I'm rich, I've prospered, I have need of nothing. And the need of nothing seems to include Jesus. Their wealth, their comfort means that they can live life quite happily without Jesus complicating things because the truth is Jesus makes life complicated. I've certainly thought, do you know what, at times it would be easier, it would be less complicated, I'd face less hassle if I wasn't a Christian. But following Jesus complicates life, but only life is found in Jesus. So the complication's worth it. That they are experiencing the wealth of the city most likely means that they are participating in the various trade guilds of that city. And that's an issue because these trade guilds had a religious component. There's no separation like we've compartmentalized things. They're doing the wee sacrifices going, it doesn't really matter. Well, it's Tuesday anyway. You know, it doesn't really matter doing this. To put it in modern day speech, they appear to have taken the attitude that business is always just business. And what they do to make money, while anybody who makes money, there's a necessity to you, isn't it? You need money to buy stuff. But there's also, it seems to be, of they were driven to become self-sufficient and comfortable. Who among us has not thought, wouldn't it be great to have enough money that I didn't need to worry about the bank balance? Wouldn't it be great to have enough money that rather than the things that I can afford, I could actually have the things that I really want? Certainly, I've thought that, thought that regularly. However, Jesus is Lord of all. And that includes not just the money that we have, but how we make that money. The small and the big compromises that the Laodiceans were making with the religious elements, never mind the ethical issues of the trade guilds, mattered. Jesus' comments, not on their passion, but upon their works, not their spiritual temperature, 
Lukewarmness is not an ancient metaphor for indifference or apathy. Now, there are two possible explanations for what the hot, cold, and lukewarm refers to. We've only got time for one this morning. If you want to hear the other, tune into the podcast. Given the message ends with Jesus knocking at the door, what is it that he wants to do? He wants to come in and eat with them. So the reference to hot and cold water probably refers to a customary practice in Asia Minor, where at the dinner table you would have hot water and cold water. The hot water might actually be kind of like something like honey and lemon. Hot drinks were healing. Cold drinks, if you live somewhere hot, are refreshing. To call their works lukewarm is to say your works are neither healing nor refreshing. They're, they're ineffective. They're ineffective because they're doing things out of the surplus of their own abilities and their wealth. There's no dependence on God. There's no activity of the Spirit because they're so independently minded that, you know what, we know how to do this stuff. We can just go on and do it anyway. So what they're doing brings neither healing nor refreshing. It just, meh. They need to let Jesus in to what they're doing. So Jesus stands at the door. Now, I grew up with the image of Revelation 3.20 as Jesus standing at the door of my heart asking to come in. I suspect some of you maybe grew up with that picture as well. In fact, there's paintings of it, isn't there? And it's a lovely image to be sure. And uh, absolutely, we want to invite Jesus into absolutely every area of our lives. But Revelation 3.20 actually probably draws upon a parable that Luke records for us, where the master's away at a wedding banquet and comes back and knocks the door to get back into his own house. And the people at the door better be awake to let him in. Jesus stands at the door of his own house, of the church, of this church, can I come in? Or are you so well organized that you think you can do this without me? And when we couple the image of the council to buy gold and clothes and eye salve with the picture we get of Jesus saying, stop doing stuff in your own strength from the surplus of your energies, your gifts, your abilities, your wealth. That kind of stuff is just lukewarm water. Now, I think I know most of you reasonably well. So I'm fairly confident to say, you know what, I don't think that's our hearts. If I think our hearts is Jesus, we want you involved. But there is a danger, isn't there? Of the longer we've been on this journey, the longer we've been in leadership, the busier we get, and in our busyness, we think, I'll just go ahead and do this, because I know how to do it. I know how to run a Sunday service. I've been to blah, 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 million of them. And we go ahead in our anxiety to be seen to do things, and we leave Jesus on the outside. Harry Mayer, professor of New Testament and early Christian studies at Vancouver School of Theology say, suggests that given our, and by our he means those of us who live in the West with a Western mindset, given our fierce independence, given our relative wealthiness, that we need to read Revelation as Laodiceans. And we need to receive that challenge. I have an icon that a confession. I have an icon at my desk. Um, it's a print because I can't afford the original. Um, of Jesus standing at barbed wire. It's called Jesus of Mary and All. And it was done by a guy in Albuquerque. Now, if you know where Albuquerque is, it's near the Mexican border. And the question is, on the barbed wire that they've constructed along the way, what side of the fence is Jesus on? 
on our nice, lovely red doors which Stuart repainted for us so they look lovely. What side of the door is Jesus on? We need to buy gold and white clothes and eye salve from Jesus. But how would you do that? How would you buy gold and eye salve and clothes from Jesus? I mean, it's not like you can go to kind of like Kingsgate up in East Kilbride and go to the Jesus store, is it? Obedience for sure is key. But I think the starting place for buying gold and clothes and eye salve from Jesus is declaring our total dependence upon him. I can do nothing without you. I may have been trained to do my Monday to Friday job. I may kind of like know how to cook an apple stew, but I can do nothing without you, including cooking an apple stew. I love this quote from Scott McKnight. If worship is one's whole life devoted to God, then any dimension of life surrendered to anything else corrupts worship. What or to whom are we surrendering? Because I think to buy gold and white clothes and I sell from Jesus is a posture of surrender and total dependence on him. So let's make sure we are surrendered in all areas of our life to Jesus the Lamb who's conquered and sat down with his Father on the throne. And one of the ways that we do that is to worship and sing. So let's do that as Fina and the team come and lead us. And now, just as Brodie has promised, here's a little bit of extra time for all the stuff that Brodie couldn't fit in on Sunday. Enjoy! In my sermon on Sunday, I mentioned that there was not time to say all that could be said about Revelation chapters 2 and 3, or perhaps even all that should be said. So, in this section of the podcast, I want to cover several issues. Well, if we think about why Pergamum is called the place where Satan has his throne, I'll explore why there are references to Balaam, Jezebel, the Nicolaitans, and what this has got to do with food and sex and why that is an issue for these churches. The message to Ephesians notes that they have lost the love that they first had. In preparing for the sermon, I changed my mind about what that means and its implications or challenges that that presents to us. And finally, I mentioned on Sunday that there are two explanations for the background which informs a metaphor of hot, cold and lukewarm water with regards to the church at uh, Laodicea. We only had time to think about one of those on Sunday and I went with the one which I think is most probable and how this helps us understand what Jesus is getting at there that their works should be healing and refreshing, but they're neither, they're lukewarm and thus distasteful and ineffective. So we think at the other possible background to this water metaphor, and you can weigh up which you think is most helpful when interpreting the message Jesus and the Spirit brings to his church there. Before that, however, I want to share with you a nagging concern that I have. I worry when we hear I worry when I hear people say or see books with a title which suggests that the Bible in general and the book of Revelation in particular is a code to be cracked or a puzzle to solve. I think this is unhelpful. Indeed, it's a misleading way to think of what the Bible is as scripture and what the Bible does and what the book of Revelation does or or can do. I find the breaking a code or solving a puzzle language problematic for a number of reasons. Firstly, it misunderstands that the primary role of scripture is not information, but formation. Now that's not to say that information doesn't play a role in our formation, of course it does. But information on its own doesn't change our hearts, our desires, our character, our will. Think of this in a everyday situation for a moment. For years we have had tons and tons of information about how smoking is incredibly bad for your health and we have loads and loads of information about our ecological environmental crisis. Yet 
this information on its own seems to be insufficient to do the vital work of forming people who live in a way that they do not smoke and suffer the diseases and poor health this causes, or where we change how we live so we, we, we can live within our God-given environmental and ecological limits. Information on its own seems incapable of doing this. Information on its own doesn't do the work of formation. So the Bible, the book of Revelation, is much more than a depository of information which we need to mine. A reading of and listening to scripture is a way in which our relationship with God is deepened as we encounter him in the Bible, Father, Son and Holy Spirit as the living word. It's as we encounter the Bible as God's living word and not just information that it changes us. To borrow a phrase from the Apostle Paul, our minds are renewed. Our vision is changed, our desires are transformed, our identity in Christ is strengthened. So, the book of Revelation is not a code to be cracked or a puzzle to be solved, but it is a vision we are to encounter and be swept up into. As we behold and enter into John's vision, so our imaginations, our reasoning, our desires are reshaped. Critically, as we experience John's vision, so our hearing becomes attuned to what the Spirit is saying to the church. My brother, he's got a great ear for music. He hears stuff in songs I do not. When I just hear a melodic sound, he can identify the individual instruments and notes. However, once he points these subtleties out to me, I start to hear them as well. He helps train my ear. And so, as we see and listen to what the Spirit says to the seven churches of Asia Minor, so like my brother with me in music, the Spirit starts to train our ears to hear what he is saying to the church. What the Spirit says to these seven churches is not just contained in chapters 2 and 3, which we're thinking about today but in chapters 1 through to 22. So, my encouragement to you over these days and weeks is read, look, listen to the book of Revelation. Read it again, look and listen slowly and allow your eyes to adjust and your ears to tune in to hear. Those who first heard what the Spirit was saying to the church in John's Revelation encountered a series of kingdom reversals. Those who were experiencing financial hardship in Smyrna and thought of themselves poor are told they are rich. Those in Laodicea, a city known for its fine fabrics and healing eye salve, they are told they're naked and blind and need to buy clothes and eye salve, not from the local market, but from Jesus. They're invited not to solve a puzzle, but as they hear the Spirit and obey what the Spirit is saying, they're invited to enter into a life-giving, character-transforming work of the Spirit that they may faithfully worship Jesus in a culture that wants him to worship Caesar. Now, to say this book is not a puzzle or a code is not to say that it's easy to read. Rather, it's to acknowledge that what was obvious and familiar to John's first hearers has become strange to us. And so we have to do some work to interpret what he's saying to us through the many images, metaphors and numbers that he uses. Back in May, I was fortunate to go on holiday and visit the beautiful city of Dubrovnik. And on our first night there, we wandered about, Alice and I wandered about to orientate ourselves and see where was what. And much to our surprise, we found a Celtic football pub. And on the outside wall was the mural of a Celtic player. Now, if you know me, you know that I don't follow football closely, so it wasn't obvious to me who this mural was meant to be. But through the wonders of modern technology, I took a photograph, sent it to my brother-in-law, who is a Celtic fan. Where I was uncertain as to who the image was of, Joe was unequivocal. It was a painting of John Brown. And in a similar way, John's first listeners would know probably unequivocally what the images John used meant. 
they would naturally grasp his metaphors. But just as I'm a stranger to who the icons of Celtic Football Club are, so we've become strangers to the world of John. And unlike his first hearers, we need help to understand his images and metaphors. Some of us have grown up with wrong interpretations of what these images mean and so how they form us. Some of us think that it's obvious what John is referring to, but we're actually imposing our contemporary ideas and idiom onto John's vision and the language he used. And this, well, this can distort his meaning. For example, as I mentioned on Sunday, the lukewarmness of the Laodiceans is not about spiritual temperature, as I for many years have thought, is a comment on their works and whether their works are healing and spiritually refreshing. This means that as we read the book of Revelation, we need to lay aside some of our assumptions about what certain images and metaphors mean. And as we do that, perhaps we will grasp and hear what John's first hearers did. Just as I need my brother to help me with music, or my brother-in-law to understand paintings on pub walls. So it's helpful to have reliable guides to help us engage with John's imagery and the world of the seven churches. I have found as helpful and trustworthy guides in Strange Land of Revelation, Eugene Peterson's wee book, Reverse Thunder, Ian mentioned that. Michael Gorman, he wrote a more technical book called Reading Revelation Responsibly. It's more technical than Peterson's, but it's still very readable. New Testament scholar Scott McKnight has just this year co-published with Cody Mashett a very readable book in Revelation called Revelation for the Rest of Us. And finally, like Gorman, a more technical reading, but again very readable, is Jamie Davis's commentary on Revelation called Reading Revelation, a literary and theological commentary. And again, that was just published uh, this year. Jamie was, for a short time, pastor at Bishop Briggs Community Church here in Glasgow. Unfortunately, Jamie's book is most expensive of these, but welcome to my world if you want to go and buy it. One of the things the book of Revelation reminds us is that we are in a very real spiritual battle. And the actors in this battle and the influence they exert and the actions that they uh, have do have real-world consequences. And this was most definitely the case for the church in Pergamum. It is in the message to this church that the only named person is mentioned, Antipas, who has been killed as a martyr. The church is commended for holding fast in the face of this terrible event and the pressure that they are under. Pergamum, now modern-day Bergama, was not just the provincial capital of the area, but it also functioned as a kind of religious capital. There's a hill behind the city, and atop of this hill was the imposing Acropolis. Now, an Acropolis is rarely just one temple. It's more like a temple complex of multiple shrines and temples. And the crown of Pergamum's Acropolis was a massive altar to the god Zeus. Zeus, of course was considered the king of the pantheon of Greek gods. That in his oracle to Pergamum, Jesus and the Spirit say, I know where you live, where Satan's throne is, is not to say that Satan literally has built a throne in the city, but it is to say a couple of things at least. Firstly, the emperor cult, the worship of Caesar and other Greek and Roman deities is not neutral and it certainly was not harmless. All of these is just a mask, they're a front for the work of Satan in this city and area. That Jesus chooses to identify this as the work of Satan is instructive. For by this Jesus is not merely saying that this is evil. Remember, Satan means accuser. And so the activities at the Acropolis, the worshipping of the emperor and other false gods manifests itself in accusations against the Christians in this city and further afield that ultimately lead to other things like the death of Antipas. No, Jesus appears to them as the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. 
And if you remember the vision of Jesus in chapter 1, then this sword is not in his hand, but in his mouth, which is a clear allusion to Jesus having the words of truth and life. The accusation of Jesus and those under it, sorry, the accusations of Satan and those under his influence are defeated by the truth and life of Jesus. Principally by the followers holding fast to his name. To hold fast to his name is not merely to say the name of Jesus, but is to hold fast to the confession that he is the son of the living God, who took on flesh, dwelt among us, who was crucified on a Roman cross, was died and buried yet, hallelujah, God raised him from the death, triumphing over sin and evil and death. And he is now seated victorious at the right hand of the Father in heaven is to confess the truth of who Jesus is, that he is alive, that he is present with us and is coming. Even if we live where Satan has his throne, that he is Lord and Saviour. And to confess that Jesus is Lord and Saviour means that we say there is no other Lord and Saviour. And this includes Caesar and the various religions of the Acropolis. Secondly, I think Pergamum was referred to as the throne of Satan because of its visual visual appearance. The visual appearance of the Acropolis and the massive altar of Zeus looked like a throne when viewed from the city. When you couple this with the fact that Pergamum was a religious centre for the region, then there's both a visible likeness to a throne and also an intensity of spiritual activity that likens it to a place of authority and power. Jesus' message to the church was not to frighten them. I think they already know that they live in a place which is spiritually difficult. Jesus' message to them was in effect to say, I see you, I see you, I see where you are, I see how hard it is for you, and here's why. Satan has established a stronghold where you live. It's a message of encouragement and hope. Jesus conquers and those who are with him, who hold fast to his name, also conquer. That the church in Pergamum is where Satan has his throne is not the only thing that's going on there. In his rebuke to them, Jesus and the Spirit raise the issue of false teaching by well, it's either groups or individuals, but by Balaam, by the Nicolaitans, and there seemed to be a connection between this teaching and the eating of food sacrificed to idols and sex. Pergamum is not alone in facing this challenge and compromising with it at various levels. There are three churches who get both praise and rebuke, Ephesus, Pergamum and Thyatira. Ephesus is commended because they hate the work of the Nickelodeons or Nicolaitans. I don't know how to say it. Note, it's their works which they hate and not the people themselves. Jesus has not changed his command to love our enemies. This holds. But to their credit, the Ephesians hate whatever it is this group called the Nicolaitans are doing and teaching. In Thyrata, the issue is not just the Nicolaitans, but the teaching of Balaam, uh, or the teaching of Balaam, but of Jezebel. It's unlikely that this is this person's real name. If indeed it's just one person, it could also refer to a group. But that doesn't really matter. What does matter is that the churches in Thyrata and Pergamum are being influenced by false teaching, and this is distorting their worship and compromising their witness. Balaam and Jezebel are both ciphers for leading God's people astray from true worship of God and faithfulness to God's commandments. You can read the story of Balaam in Numbers 22 to 25 and in, of Jezebel in 1 and 2 Kings. We know very little about the group called the Nicolaitans. Indeed, all we know about them is what we learn from in these chapters. And it's thought that Nicolaitans' teaching included some claim to victorious living. And we come to that conclusion for a number of reasons. First, their name. Now, many of you, like me, have worn at some time Nike training shoes. 
And the reason that company chose that name is because Nike is the Greek goddess of victory. For you, FYI, the USA at one point, don't know whether they still do, they also had a nuclear missile called the Nike missile. But I don't know if they've still got that or if they've done away with it. Anyway, Nike means victory or to conquer. And it's from this Nike word that we get the Greek word Nikeo. You'll have read this word if you have read your New Testament, for it's frequently used, and in most trans English translations, we translate it as overcome. For example, in John's Gospel, chapter 16, verse 33, Jesus says, Take courage, I have overcome, or I have conquered, the world. The Greek word there is Nikeo. And if Nikeo, in the Nicolaitan's name means victorious or to conquer, then Latins means people. So the name literally means the people who conquer or the people who are victorious. The church in Ephesus, who hate the work or works of this group and their teaching, and the church in Pergamum, who are told to repent from the teachings of the Nicolaitans, are both given the promise of being conquerors, of being victors in Christ. A conquering and victorious life which does not mean an escape from hardship and sufferings, but being faithful to Jesus through whatever trials and troubles assail them. What all these groups have in common is that their teaching and works distort true worship of Jesus. And when our worship of Jesus becomes distorted, then so does our witness and so does our works. And this brings us to food and sex. In church, well, perhaps not our church, but Christians talk a lot about sex. We don't talk a lot about food, but food and sex are together here. Meals where food was sacrificed to various Roman gods, including the mercantile gods. So if you were a small business person, a trader, then to get access to the market, you would have to participate in uh, these religious activities, which included these meals. This was commonplace, happened all the time, every day, in all these places. We find the Apostle Paul, who, let's remember, spent two, three years in Ephesus, addressed the issues of food sacrifice to idols in Romans 14 to 15. These sacrificial meals often included ritual sex. So a couple of points to note. This is not a comment on food or eating in general, just as it's not a comment on sex in general or even promiscuity. It's about the mixing of food, sex and worship. A key issue here is that the sacrificing of food and then eating it, participating in ritual sex, were attempts to manipulate and control the gods. It was transactional. If I do this, then the gods have to do A, B, C. If I do this, the gods are supposed to give me X, Y, Z. Temple food and temple sex reduces a loving, loyal, faithful, covenantal relationship into a commercial transaction. While Paul's answer to the church in Rome about food sacrifice to idols is, listen, if you happen to eat this stuff, don't worry, it won't do you any harm, but be careful that you don't cause somebody weaker in the faith than you to stumble. Jesus' words here in Revelation are to repent, have nothing to do with this. So why the difference? I think there is a difference because we're not actually comparing like with like. When Paul addresses this issue, there does not seem to be any involvement or participation in the religious element of this. It's more like turning up to somebody's house and them offering you some chicken, which you later find out was sacrificed to an idol. In this instance, Paul's saying, listen, don't worry, it's just chicken. That's quite different from what is happening among the churches by the time Jesus addresses them in the book of Revelation. Here the issue is not eating this food, but active participation in the ritual practices which involve making the sacrifice and which also includes various sexual acts. What we do, rather than what we eat, shapes our hearts. What we bind ourselves to through worship 
forms us. So those who were following the practices and teachings of these groups were binding themselves to the works of Satan rather than to the life of Christ. When I was thinking about this, I was thinking, do you know what, I'm not sure ritual food and sex are an issue that we obviously face today. Perhaps you can think of examples, but I, I struggle too. However, an issue we do face is that at times you hear people talk of God and prayer or God in giving, or God and our service in a transactional rather than covenantal way. If you do this, if you pray this, if you give this, if you behave like this, God will do X, Y, or Z. And to think and act like this is to think and act like the Nicolaitans and these other groups. And we do well to heed Jesus' words. Repent. Jesus says, to the church at Ephesus, the well-known words, you have abandoned the love you had at first. Now, I'd always read this as saying that they'd lost the love they first had for Jesus, the zeal and excitement they knew when they first came to faith. However, reading this rebuke in the context of the positive things that Jesus says makes me think that perhaps Jesus is saying more than that. The praise which Jesus gives the church at Ephesus is fantastic. We'd all want to hear that praise. And when you read it and think about it, this does not sound like a people who've lost their love for Jesus, who've lost their passion for God. They sound like quite a Jesus-loving, God-passionate people to me. If, as I now think, they have not lost their love they first had for Jesus, then what's going on here? Jesus tells them, that to restore the love which they had at first, they need to repent and do the works which they did at first. This suggests, given the list of what they are doing, that what they have stopped, the love they have lost, is the love for each other. Michael Gorman comments, The Ephesians' loyalty to and love of God is evident. In the midst of bouts with accommodation, false teaching and harassing neighbours, the love they need to regain is for one another. I quoted Revelation 2.4, which talks about losing this love from the NRSV, which says that they have abandoned their first love. The NIV uses the word forsaken. Both are strong words, aren't they? What is being described here is not a slow fading of something which once burned bright, but an active decision to make a change. The word we translate as abandon or forsake is aphemi, which means to release. Scott McKnight comments, This same word is behind the word forgive and refers to our sins being released from us. The Ephesians have released their love. It did not escape. They released it. McKnight's grasp of Greek is better than mine, so I'm going to take his word on that. And he reminds us that love of God and love for each other is inseparable. He's not as unequivocal as Gorman that they're still loving God but have lost their love for each other. Because for McKnight, to love God and to love each other is inseparable. Jamie Davis, he suggests that in the face of challenges of false teaching, the Ephesians had become guarded and concerned about doctoral purity. He comments that while this is commendable, It's led them to abandon the primary importance of love for others. They've become suspicious. I find these readings of Revelation 2-4 helpful and also challenging. For sure, we do well to fan into flames our first love for God. But as love grows, it changes and how we express it also changes. I love my wife Alison just as much as when I fell in love with her. But our love has changed. It has matured and deepened and grown. It's no longer like our first love. Indeed, it's probably stronger, healthier and deeper. Our love for Jesus, our love for God, should likewise grow in strength and health and depth. If our love for God didn't develop and change, that would be more worrying. But as as these readings of Revelation 2-4 remind us, Love of God looks like something. 
It looks like loving each other and loving our neighbours. This is the point that John makes several times in his epistles. That we are to love God and each other reminds us of the necessity of being connected and that connection takes place at church, the place that we can grow in our love, that we can practice that love, that we grow in our love for God, which finds its expression in loving each other and loving our neighbour. Finally, let's end with the explanation or the other explanation that I didn't have time to give on the hot, cold and lukewater warm references to the church of Laodicea. Laodicea is notable for its lack of water supply. Fresh cold water was thought to be brought to Laodicea from nearby Colossae by an aqueduct. And also near Laodicea are the hot springs of Heriapolis. You can still visit that today. The cold water of Colossae and the hot water from Heriapolis give us the cold and hot water that Jesus may have been referring to. And some think that by the time the water got to Laodicea from Colossae, it had become lukewarm rather than cold. Perhaps it was even warmed by the hot springs nearby. If this is the case, then do you know what? It doesn't change the essential meaning. Hot is healing, cold is refreshing, lukewarm is neither. Jamie Davis cautions that the archaeological evidence for an aqueduct bringing the water is thin. So, I think we're in firmer ground to suggest, as I did on Sunday, that the water refers to water served at a meal at the dinner table. I hope all of this has been helpful and give you some food for thought as you reflect further upon the book of Revelation. Thank you for listening to this week's Calling a City to Life talk. We hope that you enjoyed it and that you'll join us again later in the week for the chat. Speak to you again soon. Goodbye.